New to this type of format, essentially what I do is every week I post a poll and individuals, everybody who follows me, gets to vote on what it is that I discuss. And so this week, for this particular episode, everybody voted for the autism spectrum. So today, that's what I'm going to talk about. So let's go ahead and get started. intro so I have to give props to gonna go for it for that thank you so much for making that for me I think they popped on here so today we're gonna talk about the science of the autism spectrum so this is a pretty it, can, it seems pretty complicated there are some people who think that is hello <laughs> there are some people that think this is complicated but what we really need to do especially in regards to the autism spectrum is to kind of gain a bit of knowledge about what it is exactly. So that's what I'm going to do today is to talk to you a bit about it. So what is the autism spectrum? Well, this is a bit of an umbrella term. It covers all kinds of different things, but we have to keep in mind, <laughs> again, <laughs> we have to keep in mind that what a spectrum essentially is, is we're talking about a wide range of symptoms and things that are going on within an individual. They might have one or two of this or one of that, but it's, it's an umbrella term. There's various awesome skills that individuals that have AS have. They possess really awesome stuff. So I'm going to talk about that. There's symptoms associated and there are varying levels of what we would say is a disability. So we're going to talk a little bit about these sorts of things. So the characteristics that we see with people that are on the spectrum, they tend to have some social problems and communication difficulties, especially with nonverbal communication, this sort of thing. Um, they can have repetitive behaviors, things that they do, and sometimes these behaviors are comforting for them. Uh, they also like to repeat certain words because again, there are certain words that these individuals like, and this might be a sort of coping mechanism. They tend to have limited interests or activities, so there are things that they just love doing and that's what they want to do. <laughs> but, you know, in a way, a lot of people have interests and activities that they enjoy and there's some things that are favorite things. It's just these individuals, they're like, this is my jam and I'm on top of it and that's all right. Um, now, normally, uh, in the modern day and age, in more recent years, it's recognized in the first two years of life. So we tend to start diagnosing a lot earlier um, than we had before. Now these particular symptoms that people on the spectrum have can hurt their ability to function socially in school, in work, all of these sorts of things, because a lot of people, I think, largely it's because they're not understood so well. So hopefully this show in this episode will help people understand a bit better that they're just wired differently. And, you know, let's give them a bit of space. That's okay. So autism spectrum versus Asperger's. They used to be categorized differently. But now they're considered, Asperger's is now considered part of the spectrum. It was once what we would call pervasive development disorder. So it wasn't considered something that was on the autism spectrum. So now it's been categorized as part of the spectrum. So individuals who say they have Asperger's, well, it used to be categorized differently. Yeah, it's part of the spectrum. Science grows and we learn stuff and so sometimes we have to shift things around because we have a better understanding of it and that's a good thing so let's talk about some of these behaviors all right so people on the spectrum spectrum can have restrictive repetitive behaviors meaning that they repeat certain behaviors they can have unusual behaviors they can be overly focused on certain parts of a thing um some i've worked with some children on the spectrum there's one that just loved owls 
owls were her jam. You know, you're like, oh my gosh, owls. So it might be owls for six months. It might be deer for another six months. It might be race cars, particularly a part of it. And that's okay. So they can be focused on certain interests and moving objects or parts of objects. And they can have a lasting, intense interest in certain topics. They might really love art, you know, numbers. They pay attention to details. There may be certain facts that they're just, you're like, I know a person who knows all about a particular thing. I'm going to go talk to them. So they're inherently important in that they have this, in, this innate ability to be able to remember, you know, certain details. So this is a good thing too. So I'm going to hop over to my big monitor and show you some of the things um, people with on the spectrum may have difficulties with. All right, so for instance, some tend to be very upset by the smallest bit of change. So a slight change in their regular um, routine can be upsetting for them. Some people don't like change and you know, lots of people who aren't on the spectrum are the same way. They're less engaging with others, so they don't have a lot of eye contact. So I'm right here. They don't have a lot of eye contact, and sometimes they look like they're not listening to you. That's, that's one particular characteristic they can have. They rarely share enjoyment of activities and objects. So they might not ex openly express that they're enjoying something. In, in a particular activity, they might say, hey, look, this is pretty cool, I like that. You know, they, they may not get heavily involved in that. Sometimes they have an unusual response to those who are angry, affectionate, or in distress. They might giggle or um, they may get angry if you want to hug them. So there, sometimes there's just unusual responses to what people not on the spectrum would be like, oh, wait, why are they giggling because I'm angry? You know, rather than this like, oh, that's rude, you know, and then our response can kind of uh, exacerbate that. So there may be a slow response to attempts to gain their attention. So if you're calling their name, they may not necessarily respond right away. It's not that they're ignoring you. It's just they're kind of slow to kind of, it's like, oh, you're talking to me. Okay. They have problems with back and forth conversations. So they have a hard time following that. They may talk at length about a subject of interest without realizing everybody else has moved past this topic. So they can talk and talk and talk a long time about a subject and they may not realize that other people are not so interested. They repeat the words and phrases, as I mentioned before, a lot of times this can be a coping thing or something that makes them feel better. Unusual use of words except to those who know them. So they may say a particular word and it sounds weird or odd to other people, but people who know them are like, oh, okay, I know. They're saying that word, they probably need a little bit of time to themselves and they might be overwhelmed. So different types of words can mean different things to people that are on the spectrum. Sometimes their facial expressions and gestures don't really match their phrasing. So they might be talking about something that's upsetting and then they're laughing about it and you're like, wow, that's really not funny. But to a person on the spectrum, sometimes it doesn't match up. They might have a sing-song voice or robot-like tone. That's something that's kind of characteristic of individuals, certain ones on the spectrum. And sometimes they do struggle to understand another person's point of view. So let me take a moment to talk a bit about some of these. So essentially when we're dealing with people that are on the spectrum, I had a particular student one time who was on the spectrum, who liked the robot tone type of voice, didn't engage so well with others, super smart in my class, didn't like writing vocabulary words, needed some time to himself. I knew he understood the information because I could give him a task and he would pass it. So I diversified my activities for this individual. I'm like, okay, this person doesn't like doing definitions. I'm going to give them something different to do. He liked to draw. So I'm like, here you go. Draw me a picture of a cell and label all the parts and kind of tell me a little bit what they do. Easy, easy fix, easy fix as a teacher. Now, other students understood that he's a bit different, but I would also diversify their assignments and allow them, okay, you can pick one of these assignments. So I just kind of was like, you know, it was like a blanket thing. Everybody got to pick which assignment they wanted. I just made sure I threw one in there for that particular student that they would enjoy. 
it's not that difficult to modify your classroom. And so when I say this, I'm not saying I need people to understand they're just wired differently. They're not broken. They have preferences just like anybody else. And it's not that hard to kind of tune towards that. All right. So also dealing with people that are on the spectrum, they may have other difficulties such as being very sensitive to light, noise, certain types of clothing textures. You know, some people are allergic to wool and so they can't wear it because it makes them scratchy. You know, those are people that aren't on the spectrum. So certain types of clothing can bother them, even temperature. They may also experience some sleep problems or digestion problems and sometimes irritability. But to me, you know, we're all kind of a bit of a spectrum because we have our own preferences and our own things that we like and don't like. It just seems to be more pronounced in these individuals. So when we're talking about characteristics of individuals that are on the spectrum, we need to keep in mind they may not have every single characteristic. They may just have one thing here, one thing there. There's no box to put any one person that's on the spectrum in. So sometimes communication and understanding is what's important. So I'm going to go back to here. <laughs> All right. So yes, this is kind of what I'm getting at. I want to talk about how symptoms and behaviors for people on the spectrum can vary. It is a spectrum, combinations of various traits. There's no one fits all. There's just nothing like that. And people can experience a few combination or all of these symptoms. It depends on where they fall, more intense or less intense. So that's kind of where it comes to where you just have to get to know a person and see what it is that, where they fall. All right, so I'm gonna pop back over to here. Let's talk about the awesome things that people on the spectrum have. So what we found is about 46%, according to the CDC, 46% of individuals who fall on the spectrum have above average intelligence. They learn in detail. They pay attention to specific specificities. They have exceptional memory. They have strong auditory and visual learning, so they can remember and hear things, you know, and remember just from that very well. They tend to excel in math, science, music, and or art. You find these individuals, and the reason, a lot of reason for that is because of their attention to detail and their good memory. So they have phenomenal strengths. Also, <laughs> Let's talk about how, they're cool, how cool their brain is. <laughs> so there have been a scan of people that are on the spectrum. And what they found is these individuals have highly symmetrical brains. Brett, you know, you, we, we consider ourselves left brain and right brain. I'm a little more left brain or I'm a little more right brain. We have that, well, guess what? People on the spectrum tend to have equal amounts of communication between the both. So they equally interact. So we think that this is linked to their ability to have exceptional memories and be able to pay such attention to detail. Isn't it interesting? But there are studies that are still going on to where we're trying to fully map the what we consider, you know, a brain that's not affected by any particular, you know, mental thing. You know, I, I, I sh I'm careful about the, using the word mental illness because I, to me, since we don't know what a healthy, healthy brain looks like because we don't have that science yet. I, I, I would think that everybody falls on a spectrum somewhere and we all have different things and they just show up more in other people than others. So I'm kind of, I, I use that term loosely because I don't know that there is such a thing as a fully healthy brain where absolutely nothing's going on and has never happened. I, to me, that seems implausible. So what we do know though, People that we would say are on the spectrum have highly symmetrical brains and this they feel is or they think is linked to their ability to have fantastic memory and such attention to detail. So that's pretty cool. Whoops. <laughs> let's go over to here. All right. So let's talk about, oh, that GIF is terrible and I didn't test it. So... We're going to just pause it. 
<laughs> for a second and we got like some kind of fading thing sometimes the gifts don't work so well on my <laughs> all my presentations all right so let's talk about diagnosis testing tends to happen in about 18 to 24 months <coughs> excuse me and it's earlier if there's a family history so earlier screening might be needed if a child is at high risk and what we mean by high risk is they have siblings who have it um, if there's a, you know if people are on the spectrum in their family if they were born premature um, if they have low birth weight all of the things early you know they take into consideration a lot of different things and so what happens is is they will be referred to a child psychologist and a child psychiatrist and or a speech language language pathologist um, let's go to the next one. All right, evaluation. Boy, that is just really, okay, I'm going to pause it. Woo, wait, let me go back one. <laughs> we are just, <laughs> that is, okay, I got it to stick in a good, decent spot. All right, so in regards to evaluation, <laughs> oh, live TV is so fun, isn't it? In regards to evaluation, what do they look for when you go and they're trying to evaluate you? They're like, okay, what have we got here? What's going on? Well, they look at your cognitive level, the thinking skills, language abilities. They look, depending on when somebody's being screened, they look at age appropriate skills in the 18 to 24 age, eating, dressing. And since it's a complex type of thing, they might also do blood tests and hearing tests. Another thing, let's talk a bit about what happens if you get diagnosed um, much later. So let's say you're um, a school-aged child or an adolescent. If you're a school-aged child or an adolescent, some things might present itself. You might find they have difficulties with subtle communication, social issues, problems with figures of speech or humor. So with the school-aged children and the adolescents, what we see is the special ed team will come together and be like, okay, well, let's start assessing this particular child or this adolescent. They might notice that the social issues are a problem, that they, they have a hard time understanding nonverbal communication. They might um, have problems with friends, developing friendships. And so that's when the special education team at the school will come together and, and talk with teachers and say, what do you notice? Now, as adults, well, then, then what they would do at that point is undergo what we call psychometric testing with a psychologist interacting also with a psychiatrist for a diagnosis. Yeah, boundaries can be a problem. Um, a lot of people on the spectrum don't understand that, you know, the personal space sometimes. Sometimes things that they do might irritate another another child, but they think it's funny, and then other kids laugh, and then that's a problem because they think, okay, that reinforces that behavior. So it can be very confusing. Uh, so you see this type of behavior, especially in children and adolescents, once they start having these problematic social issues, that's usually a, a clue into the special ed team say, okay, we need testing. And so the school will have a test, will have a person come out and evaluate them. And then you also have um, psychologists and psychiatrists that will help with the diagnosis as well. Now in adults, they can have um, an autism spectrum diagnosis evaluation. And that's mostly when the adult comes in and says and they have concerns and they'll also check with family history and might even talk to other family members. So let's talk a little bit about risk factors. <laughs> risk factors. So this is a big thing, especially with parents who now are highly aware of the autistic type of symptoms. Well, the risk factors, what makes somebody a potential risk for having, um, for being on the spectrum? Boys are more likely to be diagnosed than girls. They do know that, and there's a pattern in that. Uh, siblings on the spectrum. If you have siblings on the spectrum, then you are at risk for having that. Genetics, there is a link to genetics in regards to this. And also older parents. 
Well, and they found like with genetics, about 20% of children on the spectrum also have other types of genetic um, conditions, including Down syndrome, Fragile X syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, among others. Coworker really had to fight to get access to resources for her son. Yes, um, that is very difficult, and I have I have a family member who had to go through a lot of um, problems with their with the their board of education to get the the school to recognize the diagnosis. Um, and that family member had to get other groups involved, including um, Autism Speaks and another local um, autism group. And once that started happening, they actually probably could file through, um, you know, a violation of civil rights because of the fact the school ignored the diagnosis. So it's important to know what your rights are. And that's why sometimes if you're having a problem getting your school to recognize a diagnosis, make a phone call or shoot an email to a local group and they can work as an advocate for you. Um, and that's kind of important because they're going to know the laws and, and there's usually no charge and that's what they do. They're nonprofit organizations that work to make certain that rights and that laws are being, you know, adhered to. Uh, and this child was in danger, <clears throat> actually was in danger because the fact that their diagnosis was being ignored, it spiraled them into a very deep and dark depression. And that was at the fault of the school for ignoring the diagnosis. So, and the parent was heavily active with the administration and regularly talking to them like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Um, so I understand to a degree of what you know, that family member went through. So <laughs> be certain you get groups involved because those groups will fight for you because it's what they do. So don't feel like you're alone in that. So back to other factors, other risk factors. Older parents, a mother who was 35 or older and her father who was 40 or older when the baby was born tends to be a risk factor for, um, you know, having a baby on the spectrum. And so I want to kind of touch a bit here in just a second of um, <laughs> the increase of people on the spectrum, all right? So is there truly an increase of people being diagnosed? So here's kind of where it gets hairy. There's a lot of disagreement between experts on if this is a true increase of people being diagnosed. Like, we have an increase of autism spectrum. Well, yes and no. Guidelines for diagnosis have changed and we can diagnose a lot sooner than we could before. You know, we could diagnose things, we couldn't diagnose things so, so much, you know, 20 years ago, it was a completely different game. So it's not really an increase so much as we know what's going on now. <laughs> we can test a lot sooner. There's more awareness about this, which means parents can spot symptoms earlier than they could before. Um, and doctors can diagnose in adulthood now. That wasn't even a thing, a hand, you know, a handful of years ago. That wasn't even a thing. So is it really an increased amount of it or is it just we know what stuff is now and that's kind of where we're getting to that. And since we can test around the 18 to 24 month age of a baby, about the time where we're given a lot of shots, people, and that's, I'm going to talk about this next, about the vaccine thing. Okay, so let's hop over to that right now. Vaccines do not cause autism, <laughs> all right? Vaccines do not cause autism. Now, if we have to say that 30 times and make people repeat it back to us, then maybe science communicators need to do that. And I think, I feel largely the reason why people think vaccines cause autism is because they are holding on to that bad science by Andrew Wakefield who was paid off to fake his data. That's what happened. That is the truth of the matter. That's what happened. We have had countless studies since then to show 
this does not cause autism. It doesn't. It doesn't. If you have a reaction to the vaccine, that is exceedingly rare. And usually there are other symptoms that your doctor can recognize well in advance if you take your child to the doctor through all the pediatrician type of appointments. And if you've had any history of family members reacting to a vaccine previously, you need to tell your doctor that. Because then if you have a reaction, you know, it, you know, they can choose other means to help with your immunity. All right. So there was a study involving 1.2 million children, largest study ever, a meta-analysis that looked at one, it was like 1.267 million children shows no link. There's no link. And it's at 96%, 96%, you know, accuracy that there's no link to MMRs, to any of that, that put children on the spectrum whatsoever. There's no link. If you don't vaccinate your children, and not, it not only hurts your kids, but it also hurts immunosuppressed people who cannot, who don't have the choice of getting vaccinated because of allergies, because of other conditions. Cancer patients, they can't get vaccines because they're immunosuppressed. Elderly people, um, other babies, you know, who haven't been vaccinated yet. You are hurting, you're a potential health risk to everybody else who doesn't have the choice of getting vaccinated for various health reasons. So if you don't have a history of anything in your family associated with vaccines, vaccinate your kids, vaccinate yourself. There's no reason for that. Okay, so another thing, people who say, vaccines caused my child to get autism. Think about when they get diagnosed, 18 to 24 months. 18 to 24 months, around the time you get a lot of vaccines, we can diagnose that young. And it has nothing to do with vaccines. It has to do with the fact is we know what we're dealing with now. All right? We know what we're dealing with now. Okay? So it's okay. It's all right. It's, it's, it's going to be fine. <laughs> so that's my vaccine spiel. Your brother has it too? Oh, your brother ha is on the spectrum? There ain't nothing wrong with that, in my opinion. You're different, not broken. And I, I kind of, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> so let's talk about treatments and therapies, all right? Therapy is a good thing. It's good for anyone. <laughs> I went to therapy for a little bit to deal with a thing, and it was all right. Taught me coping mechanisms to deal with an awful thing that I was going through at the time. You know? So there ain't nothing wrong with that. All right, so treatment and therapies. So if you have a family member or friend that's on the spectrum, sometimes it helps to join an autism spectrum support group so you can know how to respond. Educate yourself. There's so much information available. Now, if you're a parent and you have a child who's on the spectrum, you want to develop an intervention plan. Now, this is what a lot of educators call an intervention um, educational plan. Your dear friend of mine is, is on one one of the most awesome people you know. Aw, so you have a friend that's on the spectrum and it's an awesome person. They're really good people. You just have to kind of get, spend some time to get to know them. Um, so if you're a parent, there's something called an intervention education plan, IEP. A lot of schools are, and you know, I was talking about that before, are kind of reluctant to put a child on that because they don't really see it as an issue. And then that means they have to pay for additional resources for your child. But the thing is, is, they're supposed to. That is their job. And if they cannot provide an education for your child, they have to pay for your child to go to a private school. They probably don't want to do that. So if you kind of throw that out there and like, hey, come on now. <laughs> an IEP essentially is where your teachers, along with the school psychologist and your child's doctors, will work together about figuring out what the needs are for individually for your child associated with the symptoms that they have or they present on when they're on the spectrum. And all they really do, and essentially, being a teacher, I've had students with IEPs, if you just take a few minutes to read a little bit about the various characteristics, hello, <laughs> if you read about the various characteristics, it's not that hard to kind of, I just, I just offered whenever I needed kids who needed printed out notes as opposed to reading notes, I just offered it to everybody. Does anybody need a copy of the notes to copy from if they can't see so well? 
You're not singling out a kid. It's quite easy. Pick your assignment. Which assignment would you like to do? I have three options here. They all teach the same thing, just three different ways. Offer it to everybody. That way you're not singling out anybody. Everybody has an opportunity to benefit. And it's not that hard. You don't have to do anything special if you're just like, here, here's copies of the notes. Who needs it? You know, or can everybody see okay? You can't. All right. Oh, you want to sit over there? That's fine. Just be quiet and get your work done. I mean, it's if you're easy going about it, it's not that hard. But a lot of teachers think, oh, I got to treat this kid special because they don't understand. And I'm not knocking teachers. It's a hard job and I've done it. So I'm just saying we kind of need to shift over to making accommodations is really not that difficult. So working in that intervention plan is important. And if you need to, contact local advocacy groups. I'm familiar with them, Autism Speaks. There's a lot of different groups in the area. So if you're having trouble understanding what your rights are and what, um, what's available as far as resources, contact local groups. Usually your school will know. Um, your doctor might know some groups. Yes, what we define as normal, even have different learning styles too. Exactly. Um, but here's the thing. Part of the thing that we need to teach our kids and teach, and teach grown-ups is you are responsible for your own education, but you know, you can learn differently. So learning about how you learn is important and you can communicate that to your instructors. You know, this is how I learn. And you're like, okay, let's do this then, you know. And another thing to do, so if you're having problems um, with a school district or with your job, contact local advocacy groups to kind of find out, you know, sometimes you have to kind of go that route. Maybe if these, oh, okay, I'm going to block that person. Yeah, we don't have hate on my channel, so <laughs> we don't do hate here. Anyway. Another thing you can do is um, get a notebook of information. Essentially, hold together a notebook and record the evaluations from your doctor, information from your doctor. Well, sometimes I think people who pop on my channel are like that. They expect some kind of response out of me that's negative. I just block them. You know, I wish I could have an ir in real life block button. That'd be great. You have been blocked by scientist Mel because I cannot deal with you right now. <laughs> you know, some people just don't want to learn and they want to be rude. And when I recognize that, I'm like, okay, you're not here to learn. You're here to be rude. Block. Willful ignorance cannot be educated, <laughs> especially when it's driven by hatred. So we're just not going to go there. Anyway, so back to the stuff that matters. You buy one of those. <laughs> it's like that, that um, <laughs> you want to learn. Yay! Learning is cool. So if you um, keep a notebook, keep a notebook and record doctor evaluations and any information and feedback from teachers as well as family members, educators, anything you can kind of do to kind of piece it together and figure out what characteristics your child or family member has and, and kind of learn about them. That, that's in, it's very, very useful because since this is a spectrum, people might have one or two things or they might have a whole lot of things. So it's important to kind of understand what are the characteristics that are exclusive to the person in your life because it can vary, you know? All right, medications. Sometimes medications are needed to deal with irritability, aggression, repetitive behavior. A lot of people who tend to be on the spectrum can fall into a loop of thought. And this can be problematic, especially if they're thinking on something particularly dark. So if they start to spiral into a dark place, they can latch on to a dark idea and then it just keeps going on loop in their head. And sometimes it's hard to pull them out of that. So that repetitive thinking and that spiraling and that looping, sometimes you have to have a medication to kind of go in and give them a longer fuse to kind of prevent them from spiraling into this deeper thought to where, you know, they're just kind of losing their attention. There could be hyperactivity. 
again, tension issues, and sometimes it's associated also with anxiety and depression. The inability to make friends and, and to communicate effectively with people in their lives is exceedingly frustrating. I can't imagine how hard it would be to try to sit there and try to figure out people and not be able to understand nonverbal communication and understand when a person's doing this, they don't want to talk to you, or if they're doing this, they're interested. So they, they have to learn they actually have to learn what nonverbal communication means. And so sometimes it takes longer to do that. And that can be a link to anxiety and depression, especially associated with social interaction. You know, so sometimes they need a medication to give them a bit of a longer fuse to where they're not automatically, I'm so frustrated and this is depressing because I can't make friends. I don't know what they're saying to me and I don't understand this. It's, it's, that's what they're going through to a degree is in trying to figure you know figure all that out things that people who aren't on the spectrum understand oh this person's mad at me somebody you know who's on the spectrum doesn't understand that that's what that means they don't it doesn't process the same so they have to actually learn it and that can take time so hence the anxiety and depression you know fair enough you had to read psychology textbooks to understand you know, but hey, that's okay. We all have to learn things in different ways and not everybody's going to be good at everything all at once. It's just, that's not how the world works. <laughs> there are things I'm terrible at. I can't draw. I can't draw at all. It's terrible. It's at, you know, I draw stick people and I can make them say things to each other with word bubbles. That's the extent of my drawing ability. If somebody asked me to draw something like phenomenal, I'd probably cry. You know, because I'm terrible at it. But, you know, I could probably learn, but I don't want to. <laughs> That's me. So, another thing you can do. You can join a study. And I have, and if you're curious about the links um, associated with all of the content I've given here, I do have them on here, and I will post them on my website, scientistmail.com. So you can go and check out where you can join a study. Um, NIMH and NIH actively research individuals on the spectrum involving prevention, detection, treatments involving psychotherapies, devices, and medications to help alleviate a lot of those symptoms. I talked about in a previous episode of the science of high IQ and mental illness. I use that term loosely. You know, again, they're not broken. They're wired differently. So people with high IQs you have to kind of treat the symptoms associated with what's going on in the wiring in their brain in order for them to see their talent. That's not unlike people on the spectrum. So being able to teach them coping mechanisms and teaching them how to interact with people and allowing them medications to deal with the anxiety and the depression can alleviate a lot of those symptoms to allow them to see how awesome they are. So that's kind of part of it too. And that's a good thing. So let's talk about this stigma that's associated to people on the expression. What is Jaila's IQ? I don't know. We can look that up though. We can find that up and I can shoot you that answer on Twitter a bit later. Um, so let's talk about a bit of this stigma that's associated with autism spectrum. We have to stop stigmatizing it because of the fact people are like, well, we have an increased amount of diagnoses. You know what? There are people who probably on the spectrum didn't even know it. They don't even know it in their adults. They probably struggled as kids, but now they've learned through trial and error how to interact with people. They probably exhibit no symptoms at all, but they're probably on the spectrum. Pro you know, so there's probably a lot of people that have fallen on the spectrum. And the thing is, we got to stop stigmatizing us. They're just wired differently. They see things in different ways and that's okay. They're inherently valuable to us. Is people who are on the spectrum are able to look at things in a perception different from others. And so that makes them great at art and music and science, especially with problem solving. Cause you're looking at a thing, you've been looking at it for two weeks. You have somebody on the spectrum go, hey, you needed to do this right here. You know, and you're going, oh my gosh, you're right. If I had fixed this one thing, I wouldn't have been staring at this for a whole week. So people with different perceptions are inherently valuable to our world, especially in problem solving. And everyone is a spectrum of different things. That's kind of what, you know, being alive is. We have various characteristics. We have things that define who we are that are different. So let's try to get out of this mentality that people who are on the spectrum are broken. They have symptoms 
and some symptoms are stronger than others. We just need to work to kind of treat them to help, help them have, you know, a life to where they can see their inherent wonderful traits and have those present themselves more. That's really all that we're doing, you know. And some people have more profound symptoms than others, you know, and so we treat them differently as far as like with treatments. So let's just kind of destigmatize it. Everybody's different than we're supposed to be. I can't imagine a word, world where everybody was the same. Gosh, that would be boring. We wouldn't have like the bright minds that we have. All right, so how do we respond? I'm almost done. We're wrapping up here in a bit. How do you respond to somebody if you know they're on the spectrum? First of all, you need to educate yourself. You need to make sure you understand what it is. Learn, you know, get to know them a little bit. Just kind of sit there and say, okay, you need to understand that many of these individuals are hyper aware and sensitive to a lot of things. Light, sound, you know, everything is like super bright. Maybe it's going on in their heads and they're like, I can't process all of this at once. So give them a little space when they need it. That doesn't mean they hate you. It just means everything is hitting all at the same time. Noise, sound, just, and it just shuts you down, you know, too much all at once. <clears throat> so you can do that. So give them a little bit of space. Be clear in your communication. You need to make certain you don't say, do this whenever you, get this finished whenever you can. That's very vague. If you need something within the hour, you need to say, this needs to be done within the next 30 minutes. You have 30 minutes to get this done. Be clear in your communication because a lot of times they don't understand the subtle nuances of, whoa, do this whenever you get a chance. Well, that might be next week. So you need to be very clear and concise in your communication. They're not trying to be rude to you. They're just trying to get you to understand you know, we need clear instructions. Be direct, but be kind. Kindness is free. You know, you don't have to be rude or mean to somebody just because you don't understand them. I mean, they don't necessarily understand you so well. And so we don't get sit there and get angry at people when we're in France for speaking French and not English. It's our fault that we don't understand them. <laughs> okay, so you don't go to France and get mad because they speak French. Anyone can appreciate that, right? So when you're talking to a person that's on the spectrum, you have it, it's it's a two-way street, but you have to also understand is they don't they're they're like they're trying to understand your language better. Okay? They're not gonna get mad at you for not communicating you know, so much. So at the same time, you need to not get mad at them if they don't understand you. That's not a thing that they can fix right away. So be kind, be kind and be patient. They'll get it. They'll figure out what you mean. You just got to tell them when I act this way, this is what I'm saying. When I say this, this is what I mean. When I do this, this means I'm kind of tired of you talking to me. So give them cues, tell them exactly what you mean. And, and they, they won't get mad about that. They'll be like, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I know what you mean now. And it'll clear up a bit of that anxiety for talking to you. So that's one way to respond, to kind of just be very clear. And <laughs> that's helpful. So wide range. The autism spectrum is wide range. They have awesome skills. So we gotta treat their symptoms. Most of the symptoms can be treated, but we need to treat them in order for those awesome skills to shine. And there are varying levels of disability and, there can, and these symptoms can show up profoundly or hardly at all. And that's why it's called a spectrum. And so if we treat the symptoms, we can see the awesomeness that are in these people. Vaccines do not cause autism, so stop saying that. They don't do it. And if you need more information about, you know, what causes autism, I'm happy to shoot you those links. Um, people on the spectrum are not broken. They're just wired differently. And that's, a, that's you know, inherently a, a pretty good thing and a cool thing to do because they can see things in ways that other people can't. And that's very valuable, especially in the sciences and problem solving in art. We get to see just fantastic stuff come out of individuals who fall on the spectrum because they have these fantastic skills that are there. So let's treat the symptoms so we can see those come out. 
So I have all of these sources. This is a terrible color of font, so I'm sorry about that. Let me show you a second. A lot of what I got is from NIMH. I also got this from the CDC. Science Alert has a pretty cool article you can check out on brain scans. AutismSpeaks.org has a lot of information there. Um, and then there's also the link to the study associated with the 1.2 million children. And my images I've gotten through Google search. So there we go. Um, I want to take a moment. That's the end of the talk, but I want to take a moment to thank my patrons on patreon.com. My pledges start at just a dollar a month, and all of these people here get early access. I have an audio podcast called Hey Scientist Mel. They all have early access to it, in addition to exclusive video content, and it starts anywhere from a dollar to fifty dollars a month. And depending on your level of pledge, you get extra stuff and rewards. Well, thank you. And these people make it possible. Tony, someone who's anonymous, Mark, Jen, Carl, Anthony, Paula, Zachary, Patrick, Tony, Tristan, and Jennifer. Thank you. I've been able to get all of this stuff here. Scientistmill.com. I've been able to get um, and put it together because of my patrons. And so I have to thank them for that because now you have a website to have access to all of my educational resources. If you're a teacher, all of my slides are there. Um, my audio podcast is there, the older episodes, and then I up update it each week. I'm Scientist Mel everywhere on the internet. YouTube, Facebook, Periscope, Patreon.com. If you can contribute, this is my only job right now. So a dollar a month actually goes a long way. And I'm donating all of the um, all of the pledges from September to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital this month. So I do contribute to research as well. So, hey. And that has been Autism, the Science of Autism. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed it. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much for hopping aboard. And if you have any questions or you want to talk about things, hit me up on Twitter. That's usually the best way to get me. Or hop over to scientistmail.com and shoot me an email and check out all of the resources there where I have it. So thanks so much for hopping aboard. I hope you guys enjoyed it and I will see you guys around. Have an awesome day. Bye.